I said, what is that, preacher? If you remember last week, I told you how the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, first five books of the Bible, were written by Moses. They're written down. They're written so that you can read them. They are the scriptures. And the apostles in the New Testament quote them. The Lord Jesus Christ pointed to them and commonly accepted with no question as to be inspired scripture. The Pentateuch and the, and the following books of the prophets and the books of the writings, the three basic classifications of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings, make up the, new, the, make up the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, are, were accepted as Scripture. But here's where the devilment comes in. The Jews' religion taught that Moses received the oral law at the top of Sinai, not only the uh, written law, but the oral law. Now, what have we got now? Well, we've got two different laws. And obviously, the oral law would remain in Israel and be transmitted from generation to generation and be subject to variations because once, something's, if once it's written down, then you have a written record that you can compare. And you remember last week I told you how that they found this... Uh, the scroll of Leviticus, 2,000 years old, and it was so fragile that they couldn't unfold it, but they used computer-aided technology, a CAT scan, and in 3D, and they were able to read. It's an amazing thing. They were able to read the book of Leviticus, and what they were reading agreed exactly with what you've got in your hands. Now, what's that called? That's called preservation. See, that's preservation. But anyway, the Word of God is written down, transmitted from generation to generation, and you have a written record in your hand that anybody can have. It doesn't, it doesn't reside with just a few of the elite or with a few who have this higher knowledge where they can, where they can interpret it uh, on a higher level. That's Gnosticism. So I told you last week how that all of this came out of Babylon because Israel spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity and the Babylonian Talmud becomes the foundation for Judaism or the Jews' religion. The Babylonian Talmud is the foundation for that. And the Babylonian Talmud came from Babylon. Babylon is the seat, the mother of all idolatry. And so imagine for 70 years we have these generations that are being influenced by the Babylonian religion, Ishtar, all of that stuff. If you'll remember now in the Old Testament, when God named the months, do you remember what the first month of the year was named? Abib. That word means to spring forth in the bud. That has to do with the fact that it's springtime. Abib. When does it show up? March, April. That's the Passover. That's the beginning of months. That's when God said, this is when you start counting time. But they changed the name of it. Now it's Nisan. And these new names came from, their, came from corrupt influence. It came from Babylonian influence into the Jew or into the Jewish culture. But here's the worst devilment. And that is that the Babylonian Talmud formed, dear friend, formed orally while Israel was in Babylonian captivity, continued its formation 2,000 years ago when Christ was here and then was eventually written down somewhere along the 2nd or 3rd century A.D. Well, nobody can nail it down. Haven't been able to find it yet. Maybe you can, but I haven't been able to find when they come down with a written record. A very smart Jew by the name of Mammonides. How many ever heard of Mammonides? He was a Spaniard. He was a doctor. And he was a very learned Jew. He took all of this Babylonian Talmud, all this vast body of information and material, and codified it. So what's that mean? He put names to portions of it. In other words, if you want to know something about what you should eat, he put a code down there where you could, like, a, like, a, uh, like, a, like an encyclopedia. If you're looking for a certain subject, find a name, and you find the information as it relates to that. That's what it meant. Mammonides codified it. Mammonides was forced to convert to Christianity. Back in those days, they'd burn you at stake or uh, other things. But of course, he never was a Christian. That was all for public consumption. The fact of the matter is, a lot of people that were forced into conversions into Christianity were never Christians. 
they continued to practice their, their, what they really believed in secret. But in any event, the Babylonian Talmud grew and process and, 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 and developed and to its present form that you have today. The Mishnah is the great, the great uh, commentary and interpreter of the, Tal of the Talmud, but this is important. The Mishnah is the commentary and interpreter of the oral law. And the oral law finally found written form in the Babylonian Talmud. Now, how many are following me on this stuff? This is important. Because when you try to get a Jew saved today, and you try to witness to him out of the Old Testament, your Old Testament is just like his Old Testament, he will run to the Talmud for his final authority, and the Talmud demonizes Christ. It demonizes him. All right, so the religion 2,000 years ago that the Apostle Paul is talking about being the Jews' religion was a religion that was based on oral tradition, supposedly, that was passed down from Sinai, and that took precedent over the written Word of God because being oral, it was superior to what was written. You see the reasoning? And so, therefore, when they had the Bible in their hands, they had oral tradition. They appealed to oral tradition as a greater authority than the Bible. This is how they rejected Christ. And they rejected him based on that. It's important to know that the Jews did not reject the Lord Jesus Christ based on the Bible. I'm talking about your Bible, the Old Testament. No, sir. No, sir. Did not reject him based on that. Now, if you do any research into what the Jews believe, you'll find this. You'll find that many of their scholars, some of their greatest writers, believe there's two messiahs. The reason they do that is because there is a ruling, reigning messiah, house of David, but there's a suffering messiah, son of Joseph. So they call him Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Joseph. Mashiach is Messiah ben son of David, Messiah son of Joseph. Remember, Joseph suffered, didn't he? Certainly he did, sold into slavery. And David was the king of Israel. So they know that there are passages in the old Bible that conflict with each other when it comes to the Messiah. You can even read about them in the New Testament where they argued among themselves, well, when Messiah comes, will he not do this? When Messiah comes, will he not do that? And they had arguments among themselves. The reason they did is because there is more than one perspective on the Messiah in the Old Testament. So they came up with two Messiahs. You know, as a Bible believer, there's only one Messiah. The reigning Messiah and suffering Messiah is like this. When he came the first time, he suffered. When he comes the second time, he'll reign. That's how you explain that, and that makes more sense than anything. So when he comes again, he won't come as the Mashiach ben Joseph, the suffering Savior. He'll come as Mashiach ben David, David, or David, the reigning King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, folks, he'll show up and they'll see him and they'll mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. Amen. And they'll ask him, where did you get these wounds? And he'll say, in the house of my friends, from my people. And they will cry and they will weep and they will mourn, but salvation will roar out of Zion Amen. because they will be saved when the Messiah comes back. That's going to happen, folks, sure as you hear. But right now their eyes are blinded. And it's quite a remarkable thing when you think about the fact that their eyes are blinded. How were they blinded? They were blinded by oral tradition from Babylon and the written tradition today of Babylon, which is the Babylonian Talmud. And guess who started all of this mess? Nimrod. And Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist. Isn't that an amazing thing? So the Antichrist in type has blinded the minds of the Jews to reject the true Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have set in contradistinction to each other the false Christ and the true Christ. Antichrist means against Christ, but it also means set in contradistinction to Christ. In other words, a contrasting between the two, the true Christ and the false Christ. And the fact of the matter is today the world has accepted the false Christ. Because when one comes in his own name, you'll receive him. That's it. He said, and they have. They received him. 
And why is it? Because he's the greatest human, the most wonderful uh, 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 victor, uh, creator. Uh, uh, he, 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 he relates to mankind, and the reason he relates to man is because he relates to the fallen nature of men. And the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them for their foolishness to him. And there's no way in the world that they'll ever accept the true Christ except by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit's the only one that can make the real Christ known to you. And that's his work in the world today, John 16. So the Jews' religion of 2,000 years ago, the, the Apostle Paul is talking about, is the religion that he was taught from a youth, that he was zealous in traditions of his fathers. His faith was not based on the Bible. His faith was based on the oral traditions handed down to him that eventually became the Babylonian Talmud. Having that in his hand, he was completely blinded, he was completely ignorant, and he was completely guided by a satanic power. That's why it was easy for him to kill people, because he was guided and, 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 and by a satanic power and probably more than likely filled uh, demon-possessed. But, he was, he, but he, was certainly, he was certainly an enemy of Christ. But what got him saved? A personal confrontation with the Lord God Almighty. And I'm going to tell you something, that this, this, this spirit world I'm talking about this morning, this occult world is a real world, folks. Demon possession is a real thing. It is very real. And, 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 uh, and, and they understand the power structure. They know the levels of power in the spirit world. And when it comes to a confrontation between the Lord Jesus Christ and any demon in hell, guess which one runs? But it had only it will only come. It won't be I adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out of him. That's not going to work. That'll get you in trouble. <laughs> Seven sons of Sceva, exorcist over there in the book of a book of Acts. No, it's going to be by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my Lord and my God and my Savior, and I know him, and the demon will know if you know him. <laughs> you come out of him. And it's by his authority and by his name. And therefore the confrontation is not between you and the demon. It's between Christ and the demon. And it will win every time. So he rejected. And therefore because of that, you got, it, you got the mess that's going on today. Yes, sir. That's right. That's why we need to always Christians be fasting and prayer and, and keeping our as much as we can keep our minds clear and pure to the right. This this kind is what he said. This kind. They they were upset because they couldn't cast the demon out. He said, This kind, which means that he begins to delineate the difference between one demon and another demon, the hierarchy, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, all of this stuff, there are levels of power and authority in the spirit world. And at the very top is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Yes, sir. And that's, uh, that, was a, that was a real, that was a confrontation, and they couldn't do anything about it. And, and not by the fact that they were, they were apostles, but that wasn't enough. That couldn't do it. It took the power of Christ. But the only way that the power of Christ could be applied was for them to go through what had to be done in that case. So when we come over here to Galatians 1, he said, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals. Now don't you notice how important this is? Here's why this is so important. Where this is located. This is in Galatians. Now notice carefully. What's going on here? Why is the Apostle Paul pulling this out and why is he telling them this? Now, he, uh, most of them, he didn't tell them anything they don't already know. But why is he saying this? Why, do he, why is he saying to these Galatians, I profited in the Jews' religion. You know who I am. You know where I came from. In other words, the Apostle Paul says, I know all about the Jews' religion. I know what it's based on. I know what it's about. I know what their message is about, and I know how subtle and deceptive they are and satanic they are. Now, before I go further, you need to understand something. When I talk about the Jews' religion, I'm talking about rabbinic Judaism as it relates here to the book of Galatians 1. I'm not talking about Kyrite Jews. 
You remember I said last week that a Kairite Jew rejects oral tradition. They reject it. So they have nothing to do with the Babylonian Talmud. They had nothing to do 2,000 years ago with the Jews' religion. If you remember, when Nathaniel, Nathaniel, the Lord said, Behold, a what in whom is no guile? That's right, an Israelite. And if you go to the book of Romans, chapter number 11, and look at it carefully, he's talking about Israelites. All right? The reason that's in there is so you'll know that an Israelite, like, the, like Timothy, he said, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation. He's saying that there is a clear line of demarcation between the rabbinic Judaism of the, of the age 2,000 years ago and the Jews who had rejected that garbage and stayed with the Bible. There's a clear difference between the two. Timothy was raised by Jews who believed the Bible, not oral tradition. That was the difference, okay? And when he said Israelite, he's referring to those who, who were of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For example, when, uh, when Simeon came to the temple and Anna came to the temple, and they were there night and day constantly praying for the restoration of Israel. They were praying for the coming of the Messiah. These were not two Jews of the Jewish Jews religion. Amen. These were those who had the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were looking for the coming of the Messiah. So it's what a thing. Here's why this is important here. Here's why it's so important. Paul was an outsider. For some of them he was always considered to be an outsider. Remember, he was a persecutor of the church. Remember, Ananias, when the Lord said, Ananias, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles. Ananias said, now look here, Lord. <laughs> he's been persecuting your people. He's got a terrible reputation. Now, what in the world's going on here? And the Lord said, I've chosen him. I'm going to, I have, I'm going to show him great things. He's going to suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias accepted him. And Ananias, by the fact that Ananias accepted him in Damascus, he was able to be received by most of the brethren in Damascus. But the folks in Jerusalem weren't too quick to jump on board. Paul had a, he had, he had a while before he would be accepted among the brethren. Now think about this for a minute. Here's an outsider, Johnny Come Lately, who had been a persecutor of the church. And now he's embraced Christ and begun to preach the gospel his gospel seems to be just a little bit different than what was coming out of Jerusalem because Jerusalem was strongly tainted by Jews, Judaism. We call them Judaizers. And Peter, Peter, folks, upon this rock I'll build my church. Peter, some of them think it's Peter's the, the one God's going to build his church on. Peter over here had done this. In time past, he had eaten with Gentile believers. He had eaten with them because he had his experience with Cornelius. Got him settled, got him straightened up. He wouldn't even go into Cornelius' house. He said, I've never eaten with an unclean man. God said, don't call unclean what I've cleaned. And of course, the sheet come down from heaven, all right? Peter goes back to Jerusalem, recounts to them what happened to him, all right? So in the mind of Peter, he knew God had accepted the Gentiles, the dirty, low-down, goyim dogs. God had accepted them, and now they were part of the body of Christ. But he had eaten with Gentiles. Now the Judaizers come in, and they begin to say, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. You cannot go eat with these Gentiles until they are circumcised and until they start keeping certain portions of the law of Moses and you're not, going to, you're not going to fellowship with them. You're not going to be with them publicly. This is not going to happen. And you know what Peter did? He acquiesced. He backed down. He gave in to their threats and intimidation. That's what he did. That's what he did. He did it, folks. Do you know what Paul did? He got mad. He went in there with a sledgehammer. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, God received the Gentile by grace, and he receives us by grace. And circumcision's got nothing to do with it. And you can read over there in the book of Acts chapter 15, the law they laid down to the Gentiles, what they were required to do. 
very, very, very few things. Not to do with the law. Just don't eat things strangled, uh, avoid fornication, things like that. But the, the Apostle Paul walks in there and says, hold on a minute. You have denied the foundation and the basis of what the gospel is all about. You've rejected it. And he said it to Peter. And he said it to all the rest of them. A confrontation took place. Now this is why the Apostle Paul lays down before this in the narrative of telling you what's going to happen. He lays down the fact that I started from the Jews' religion. I know what I'm talking about. And the, and the, and the gospel of the grace of God was in jeopardy of being corrupted. And that's what happens. Look how he says it over here in Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number, well, let's just start with verse 1. I mean, that'll give us, you know, this, let's read the thing here. Galatians 2, 1. Fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, took Titus with me also. Went up by revelation, communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, watch this, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave, no, we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Here we are. This is very important. The Apostle Paul was the foundation that God laid to deal with the original 12 apostles and to lay down the foundation for the preaching of the gospel. And look what he says. But of these who seem to be somewhat, who's he talking about? Peter. James and John. <laughs> Boy. But of these who seem to be somewhat, what, whoever, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrary wise. When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, not two different gospels, two different ministries. That's what's going on here. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now watch this. And when James, Cephas is Peter, and John, these are, this is Peter, James, and John, folks. This is the, the inner circle. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. Watch this. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. He's eating with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled likewise. In plain words, they followed him. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel... I said to Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? In plain words, if you, a Jew, can go live as the Gentiles and still be a Christian, were you still a Christian, Peter, while you were living with the Gentiles? Well, then why do you require the Gentiles to come and live as the Jews or become a Jew to be a Christian? That's his argument. And Peter, of course, had no reply for it. There was no reply for it. But there's a greater truth in all of this, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Verse number, uh, verse number 15, who, We who are Jews by nature 
and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And he says on further, if I build again the things that have been destroyed, who am I? I make myself an offender. What a thing. Peter, James, and John, apparently, and Barnabas, for certain Barnabas, according to the scripture, was carried away, followed Peter, followed Peter into this error, ter terrible error, terrible error. Because you'd imagine what would have happened had, uh, had, this not, had this confrontation not taken place. All of the corruption of the Babylonian Talmud, of the oral tradition of the law, could easily, once you open the door, folks, once you open the door, then Pandora's box is opened. And once you open it, then anything else can come right behind it. And it will, for certain. It'll come in. This is why you have to stand as firmly as you possibly can. For by grace are we saved through faith, if not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace. Not a perversion of grace, that we may sin, that grace may abound. No. But the truth of the grace of God is that Jew, Gentile, bond, free, red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, Italian, German, Portuguese, makes no difference who you are. You come to Christ by simple faith in his finished work at the cross. For you, he was dead, buried, rose again the third day. That's salvation. Not that plus keeping the Ten Commandments. Not that plus keeping the Sabbath. Not that plus anything. That alone in itself is what saves the sinner Amen. is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive him. The Apostle John said in 1 John 5, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Amen. It's that simple. It's not whether you've been baptized. Amen. And I'm not against baptism. Baptism is a good thing. It's not going to save you. And the Ten Commandments, good thing. But that's not going to save you. And the, and, the, and the moral code of God. And they have, if you want to get into the law, there's 613 of them. If you want to get into counting all that, you know, wire yourself out and drive yourself insane. The truth of the matter is, simply by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, by simple faith, asking Him, take, taking Him into your heart, embracing Him, Lord Jesus, save me. He will come into you and He will save you. And that was done by faith. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing with the word of God. You don't need to be circumcised. None of this other. None of this other. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to keep, you don't have to keep some of these washings and some of this tradition stuff. That, I mean, who's, who, does, who determines how much is piled on you when it comes to a matter of being saved? He did something, didn't he? But he gave you the basis for why he did it. He said, I profited in the Jews' religion. The Jews' religion is still around today, folks. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's moving apace. The Jews' religion is, is uh, it's quite a thing. I watched uh, the other morning, uh, for me it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, but I was watching the funeral of Shimon Perez. Israel is about six or seven hours ahead of us, something like that. And uh, leaders from all over the world, heads of state everywhere. We had two up there, too. We had Bill and we had the other one. <laughs> they, uh, they showed up. But they got up and they talked and they talked about this man. And he was no doubt a man that loved peace. He was a man that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything personally about Shimon Perez. I know he was the president and the prime minister of Israel. He's the only man that held, ever held both offices. He was the president and prime minister of that nation. And uh, they talked about how he evolved over the years in his position. As he started out, he was a hawk. And, but he, he evolved into a man of peace, willing to give away a certain amount of land for peace and a pipe dream that would never, it'll never happen, it's never gonna happen. And I thought to myself, he's, he's probably, you don't get any more decent, more moral, more upstanding in character than a man like that. He was, he's a very respectable man a man that would keep his word, an honorable man, a man of honor. But I thought to myself, there's something missing here. <laughs> there's something missing. And you know what it is? 
It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. The man lived an exemplary life. I would that some Christians that I've known would live that kind of life. It's so sad that Christianity today has lost the idea of character. Yeah, their word doesn't mean anything. They promise you the moon and mean squat. When I was in the military, I had men in there I'd trust with my life more than I would most Christians I've known. We'd never leave one in the street. That's one of the things that they pounded into our head. You don't leave your buddy out there. You get him. You take him with you. And so we'd go out together and we knew we'd get back. <laughs> we'd take care of each other. But Christians, I've seen them turn on each other. I've seen them stab each other in the back. I've seen stuff like that. Such a horrible thing. It's awful. It should never be. It should never happen like that. It shouldn't happen. It's because that what goes on in the church house today is so shallow, so thin, so, such a small veneer, so, such a thin veneer that everything is superficial. The relationship is superficial, superficial. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you got into each other, if you really started bearing one another's burdens and really began to understand what communion of the saints is about and pray for each other, not just have a little hand-picked few that you, that, you, that you care about, but all of them, all of them. It, well, that, that's, the, that's what binds us together is when you really love each other. That's a powerful thing, powerful thing. But, super, but Christianity is so superficial, so superficial. It's so fly by night. And, uh, but here and there you'll find some that who, who begin to understand what that communion of the saints is about. That's being born again, folks. We bear one another's burdens. We, we have the same spirit. That's the same life that we have one with another. That's what makes us what we are. That's how we know what we've got is true. If you have the Holy Ghost, that's proof positive to you that what you believe is real. And there's a God in heaven. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, see, it's just all intellectual with you. And your mind can be changed just like that. And I'm afraid that an awful lot of Christianity operates on a, on a uh, natural mind just like that can be changed. There's a battle that goes on and rages in there. So what we've got now, 2,000 years later, and I firmly believe this, we've got the truth and the church of God is still here and the communion of the saints is real and salvation by grace through faith is real and it changed my life and I know it's changed your lives, many of you, no question about it. And once your life changes, it's all, it, it, you'll, never, you'll never be the same again. But notice, it had nothing to do with the law it had nothing to do with any man-made system. It had to do with simple faith, believing, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's one of the biggest things you could ever use to understand the New Testament is what I just gave you there. All right, I got five minutes left. I'm going to come to a close. I can't start on another thing with that, no more time than that. But uh, you... Uh, I've said, uh, I've, how many, if somebody asks you what the Babylonian Talmud was, would you know it? Tell them. That's a big deal. It's important. How many know the difference between the Babylonian Talmud and the Koran? Who wrote which? See? Or the Hadith. That's getting a little deeper, but uh, these are Baghad Gavitas, if I pronounced it correctly. All kinds of religious scriptures that are out there. But there's only one that's the Word of God. Amen. The Bible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Are you talking about when they came to Moses and he, when they observed him that he was sitting all day long yes, judging everything that came, he was there yeah. 20, practically 24-7, worn out all day long? Yes, okay. yes.
The Sanhedrin is a product of Babylonian, the Sanhedrin is a product of the Babylonian captivity and the Pharisee, rabbinic Judaism. It all was born there during that period of time. And that's where the real corruption started during the 70 years in Babylon. I'm not sure I follow you on the leaders now. What are, you, are you talking about the people that, that were chosen to fill in for Moses and do the jobs during the day? Uh, is your question, was that of God or was that a man-made thing? In other words, was it God's will for Moses to sit there all day long, every day, and, and, and judge the, every small matter that came before him? Or was it God's will for him to have subordinates, you know, to, to, uh, to take care of, the, of other things? Well, you could use the New Testament example. Choose you out seven men full of the Holy Ghost to oversee these things. And uh, the Greek word is diakon, and that's a servant. And uh, we, 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 uh, we transliterate that word into English, which literally means we take the word out of Greek, the letter out of Greek, put it in English. Deacon is where we get the word. Servants in the church. In other words, to remove some of the burden and responsibility of the pastor and give it to men who are mature and capable of handling things like that. And the elders also are in the church for that purpose. So if you have a New Testament principle like that, I would think it would apply to the Old Testament too. In other words, I would think it is God's will, would have been God's will, for Moses to be freed up to handle a lot of other things that he had to do. Somebody had to lead those people. And you can't lead them being, sitting there in judgment. There are times he needed to get alone with God and God talked to him because the Bible says God showed him his ways and not his, his acts. So uh, I personally believe, I've heard it said both ways. I've heard it said that it was not God's will for, them to, for him to uh, choose subordinates to handle that. But I personally don't think it, I think it is, I think it was God's will to free him up and let him have people to help him yeah, because he was running the whole show, and that included every argument they had, and uh, you know, like that, or every disputation over property or whatever. You know, in, uh, any of a thousand things that can happen, when you get a thousand people together, you got a thousand problems. <laughs> <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> yes, sir. Preacher, uh, on that subject, a lot of folks give the Greeks uh, the uh, credit for democracy. They do. No way. And they have judges, and you know your your executive branch is supposed to set up and execute judgment and all these different checks and balances. And so the Greeks all the time get that that credit. But honestly, if you look here, like you're saying, that's what 1500 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. you, got a, you got the first almost democracy right there. Right. Now Moses had the final say. Yes, he did. The problem with our federal government's checks and balances, all they do is write checks. <laughs> balances are gone. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you've got the legislative branch and the, and the judicial active, active uh, judicial activism is taking place of the, of the legislative branch, absolutely. And then you've got these presidents who have their, what they call them, presidential directive orders, what they call them? Executive order, yes, executive order. And they go around the whole Congress and start writing that stuff. Yeah, all kinds of abuses that's uh, going on. Amen. <laughs> the only government I know of is the government of my Lord God that will ever work right and all the rest of them are going to be messed up. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, that's the only people on this earth that will point to the same source of authority that we do. You've got to remember that. It's the Jew. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Keturah. And in doing so, will you imagine following the, uh, the example that Abraham was given that the head of the family was the priest of the family? Uh -huh. that, so that uh, Jethro, as we understand it, was a priest, priest of Midian. Midian. He was following in the tradition of Abraham. Uh -huh. Absolutely. In the same vein, following things directly in the eyes of God. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Absolutely, he was. Yes, sir, he was. He was a godly man. Yes, sir, he was. Yes, sir. <coughs> That's true. That's good. Judge, lawgiver, and king. Amen. That's the three three branches, and then you've got a you've got the fourth branch of government. Do you know what that is? It's called the fourth estate. You know what it is? That's right. The news media. Yes, sir. They account to no one, but they'll destroy you. Yeah, that's the fourth branch. All right, we've run out of time. We'll have we we'll pick it up next week. Brother Chafin, you dismiss us, please.